Welcome, gals, guys, and everyone else. I'm Hayes. This whole setup is Armored Brownies, and today we're going to do a nice deep dive on the making of this. My most recent mask. The construction took basically a sampling of every discipline that I regularly practice and a show here on this channel. So if you want to see how this was made and possibly learn yourself, carry on watching. If you just want to pick one up for yourself, head over to my Etsy store. Someone's already done the work for you. Right, we start from very simple beginnings. We have a head form. Now this can easily be a cheap foam head like this. You'll get these things for like a fiver on eBay. You can sculpt on these, but you've got to be a little careful because they're a tiny bit smaller than a normal human head, but they're still a great place to start if you're learning. Or you can invest in something like this, which is a Monster Maker's Ed head. We also have the Alana head. So the two different types of head, although I will say this one runs a bit small for my liking, even for women. So perhaps keep that one for children. If you want to be super fancy, a plaster cast of someone's head. You can see this one has been through the wars. But how does he smell? Anyway, bad puns aside, what are we slapping on our head? I sculpt in clay. This stuff is called wed clay, W-E-D. This is a water-based clay. It's very soft, it's fantastic to use, and you can let it tap dry out as you go. So, who wants to see how we turn this block of wet mud into something we want? Let's go! And as with all of the sculpts we have done recently, we start with massing out our area that we're sculpting in. This basically involves taking large handfuls of this nice soft clay and pressing it into the head in basically the overall shape and form of the final thing, defining the area in which we're going to sculpt. This part of the sculpt is nice and haphazard, and although it can take quite a while to get enough clay onto your sculpt, it is really important for the next stage where we start defining the anatomy. Once we're happy we have enough of this massed out, we then use our sculpting tool to carve parts down and build other parts up to try and make sure the entire thing is as even as possible. You can see when I get to this stage because I start smoothing the clay out so I have a much better idea of where the definition for the sculpt is. And another really important thing to be doing is to be looking at the sculpt from different angles, lay it down on its back, take photos of it from different sides so you can see where it is uneven because it's, really, it's actually really hard to judge symmetry just with your own eyes. If you're doing something very mechanically accurate, taking photos of it and then putting it in Photoshop and drawing lines across it to make sure everything is as even as possible is a really good thing to do, especially if you have the time to work with. And if you're keeping this clay nice and wet with a spray gun and overnight covering it in a plastic bag or some cling film, then you will have enough time to work with it. Once we're happy with our overall anatomy and the basic shape and proportion of it, I then start to put the tongue in. The tongue actually caused a fair bit of problems because the tongue is very heavy, the lower chin is very heavy, and it's protruding off our sculpt quite some distance. So what I actually ended up doing was getting some aluminium armature wire and putting it through the jaw underneath the tongue to prop it up so it could hold its own weight. It was a bit of a haphazard process and if I were planning better, and hopefully you'll plan better now that you've seen me make this mistake, I would have known that I needed that ahead of time because this clay is quite heavy and not very structurally sound. If you're interested, my next sculpt is already on my table and it's Zenyata. I've 3D printed some parts for them, but I don't know what I'm sculpting after that. So please, please, please drop a comment below on what you would like to see the Armored Brownies channel tackle next. Full head sculpt, half head mask, 
monster effects? Let me know. Or if there's any aspect of this process you want me to do a much deeper dive in, I can also spend a bunch more time making a much more detailed video on any single part. And now that the tongue's in, we actually start to do a bunch more of the details around the head. Now, putting details on these masks is less of a build it up, cut it down process like we do for the massing out, and more of a slowly building up the shapes with little bits of clay, using our sculpting tool to put little bits of clay down and then shaping those into our correct forms. One of the reasons we do it with a sculpting tool rather than just taking little beads of clay in our hands is because your skin absorbs the water from the clay and can dry the clay out as you're putting it on, which makes it harder to sculpt with. However, sometimes you want the clay to be a little bit more resistant because you might have put a little bit too much water in the bag full of water-based clay. So, as I said earlier, tactically dehydrating your clay can be a very useful skill but it's also something you kind of learn by doing. Don't fret if you don't get it right the first time, just spend a little extra time working with the clay that you have. I get asked quite often what materials are the best for a new person to start with, and really, it's whatever you have access to. The easiest stuff you can get hold of is the best stuff to use. It's like they say with content creation, what's the best camera for making videos on the internet? And that is the camera you already have. As we reach towards the end of this sculpt, we've left it a couple of days for the surface to dry out a little bit, because we need to do that if we want to put any fine details in it. Because this clay is quite soft, it is hard to put very fine details in it because each mark moves a lot of clay. But if you let the surface dry and reach a condition that's known as being a bit leathery, you can then put some nice fine details and sharp edges for the brow crests around the nose and the tongue and also for the wood texture. Now, I love painting textures on masks and one of the ways to give yourself plenty of opportunity to do that is to sculpt as fine a texture, as much a texture as you can. Because one of the things you need to think about when you are sculpting things for a full-size human to wear is that most textures in computer games aren't rendered at photorealistic quality. And even those that are, still don't look as detailed as an object in real life would. You can look at it and you know it's made out of wood, but something actually made out of wood would have a lot more finer texture in it. You kind of have to assume from real world references some of the details that you're going to be sculpting into the mask. And here at the end, we actually use a mixture of stiff bristle brushes, sponges and sculpting tools to sculpt in our wood grain effect. To get a really nice subtle effect, we end up going over it with one tool, smoothing it down ever so slightly, going over it with another tool and smoothing it down again. We keep on doing this because it gives us a very nuanced design with bigger creases, within smaller creases, within smaller creases, and so on and so forth. And we do all this until we have a sculpt we are happy with. And this is the finished sculpt. I've sprayed it down with some primer, which seals the surface and hopefully allows it to survive the mold making process a bit better. But I hope you agree that this is a sculpt we can be happy with. So happy, we go on to make the molds. Now, don't worry about the fact that this mask has come off of its sculpt is because this clay has dried out because it's been a couple of weeks since I finished that sculpt and it sat on the head for a little while and as you can see cracked all around it just from where the clay has contracted but this is a big block of heavy clay even with all the water out of it we don't need this now because I've already made the molds for this should we have a look at how the molds were made we start making them by building up our mold walls 
these are less for the overall shape of the mold because we're not doing a matrix mold here that's a whole other thing this is more to stop all of the silicon escaping as the first couple of layers of silicon we want to put on want to be nice and liquid so here you can see i'm using foam board you can use a foam board styrene plastic card cardboard anything like that really as so long as you can make it watertight between all the joins and here you can see I'm making it watertight by filling in the joins with clay just to make sure there's no room for any of the silicon to escape and well for one drain out of the mold but two get your entire studio covered in silicon <laughs> and once you have something that looks a little like this you're ready to proceed For something like this, you definitely want to hit it up with some mould release. Although the silicon won't stick to the clay of the sculpt, it will however seep in a little bit to the surface of either the cardboard or the foam board and such. So hitting it with some mould release agent stops it from doing that and the silicon comes out cleaner at the end. As I said, the first layer of silicon we put down is a nice liquid layer. This will capture all of the details Considering we spent a lot of time putting some nice fine texturing in there, we want, it to, we want it to be able to permeate through all of the really fine little details on our mask. As we have it mixed up, this is just normal room temperature vulcanization silicon that will set quite slowly, which allows us plenty of working time. When we mix it up, we can then pour it out from a nice height to string out the silicon and hopefully pop, pop, pop any of the bubbles in it. Because it's gonna seep over the entire sculpt, it will go thin enough that it will actually expel a lot of the bubbles itself. You can get some very advanced silicons for some different purposes, which won't shed all of their bubbles as easily. So you need some rather specialist pieces of tech, such as a degassing chamber, but we don't have access to one of those. So we just need to do this nice and slowly and carefully. Though sometimes you will see big bubbles building up underneath the overhangs, like here, underneath the tongue, behind the nose, and just inside the cheeks. Those, you can kind of massage them just a little bit to make sure that the bubbles are popped and that silicon is wetting the entire surface. And we carry on doing this for one layer, and in fact, I actually did two layers of liquid silicon for this, just to make sure the whole thing was done, and each layer was about 400 grams of silicon, to give you an idea of how much I used. And one of the reasons I had to do two layers, because this sculpt has a surprising amount of surface area, because it's quite far forward, it protrudes a lot, it's very bulky, it's quite high volume, and other words. And once the first two layers that we've put on are nice and tacky, we don't want them to be perfectly set, but we also don't want them to be still liquid, we move on to our next layer. This layer is going to be the brush on layer. We actually use something called silicon fixotopic. And fixo is an agent that you add to silicon, which makes it go thick. Here you can see, I pull off the sides of the mold walls so you can see where the mold ends and we've got a nice, and we've got a really nice definitive end to the edge of the mold, which means it'll sit in our mother mold comfortably. But there's lots of overhang, lots of big empty voids here. And we're going to be using this thickened silicon to fill those overhangs in and give us a lot more structure. I've heard this being described as toothpaste silicon. But I prefer just to call it brush on silicon or just thick sewed silicon or just thickened silicon. Either way, we apply this slowly with a brush, working it into all of the details until we have kind of a big homogenous cake shape. A lot of people say it looks like I'm icing a cake when I'm doing this, and I agree. You don't want anything particularly protruding out of any of these surfaces. You want to make sure it's as universally thick all the way around as possible, because you don't want thin bits. And also, you want to be very conscious of leaving air bubbles in there, which is one of the reasons why you use a brush instead of what I used to do, which was use a spreader. Turns out, using a brush for brush on silicon is actually significantly better than using like a palette knife or something. Who knew? Maybe that's why it's called brush on silicon. <laughs> but we all learn from our mistakes. And 
then we get to this point where we have a big pile of silicon ready for its mother moulds. So, a note on mother moulds. Silicon on its own is floppy and won't hold the shape of the rigid sculpt you just had. What we need to do now, if I get this out, we need to take this, which is our mould of the sculpt we've just taken. It can't even hold its own weight up. We need to take this and give it a structural jacket. Now, unfortunately, I didn't record the making of the mother mould because I did it in fiberglass and therefore I did it in an environment better for using polyester resin being the active resin in fiberglass. Therefore, I wasn't in a position to record it, I'm afraid. But I would also not advise going straight for one of these, which is a two-part fiberglass jacket mold. That is, it's a little bit difficult, although here is a quick look at halfway through the mold making process. If you've ever wondered what the different layers of a mold are, here's a good place to show you. We have the mother mold. This is the outside bit. Here I'm doing it in two parts so it can come off in halves from the silicon mold, the actual mold proper that you sort of understand as being a mold. And then underneath this we have the original sculpt. So when both halves of this mother mold are on, otherwise known as a jacket, we will bolt them together and then that will hold the silicon rigid and in the same shape as the original sculpt. Therefore, all of this floppy silicon doesn't just fall in on itself. What is an easier thing to go with, and what I've made a few of before getting to that point, it is a single piece jacket mould. It still has the same cut-ins. This is one of my first times doing it out of fibreglass. I've always said mould making is my weakest skill. This still has the jacket, sits in there nicely, you have registration marks around the outside, and this rotocasts fine with the surface around the side. However, there is a much easier option, though it comes with its drawbacks, which is this, using plaster bandages. We have our silicon. This is the exact same silicon as, as is in the other two molds, just the catalyst was a different color. It goes over it just as the fiberglass does, but these are literally plaster bandages. What I do is impregnate hessian, strips of hessian with plaster and just go over it. And to be fair, that's exactly how you make these, which is a strip of glass fibre matting impregnated with polyester resin and then laid up over your silicon mould. The big difference being you only need about two layers of really thin polyester resin to get a mother mould. However, the plaster, this is a big wad of rock and makes the whole mould quite heavy. So I hope that gives some insight into making your mother mould. If you do have any questions about the specifics of this, I can talk you through any help you need. Comment below or send me a message over Facebook. Now, shall we see how we then take this and fill it full of resin? We are going to be making these masks out of rotocast resin. So this is equal parts A and B mixed up. You can see I'm doing it on a scales. The scales are covered in cling film, by the way, because I've ruined enough scales by spilling chemicals on them. We just mix it up and pour it into our mould. We have used some mould release agent on here that not only makes the resin come out easier, it prolongs the life of your mould. So once it's in there, we just carry on the mould moving the entire time. We've used 100 grams of resin for this, so 50 of part A, 50 of part B, because it's quite a large object and you kind of get a feel for how much resin you need to use after a while of doing this. And you can see the colour of the resin slowly changing and as it gets to basically white and stops moving you can then let it rest and let it cure. But we actually use three 100 gram layers for this mould because it's such a large piece and once we've got all of those layers on, I've skipped two of the layers I'm afraid, we then take it out of our mother mould and slowly peel the silicon back off our resin. One of the big things that you need to do when demolding your resin is to make sure you're pulling the silicon, compressing the resin, rather than trying to rather than trying to just pull the silicon off, you're peeling it off, rolling it off like a banana. So you are putting compression across the resin, compressive force across the resin, rather than trying to pull the resin open. And also slowly working around the edges just to de-stick it from the silicon also helps. So 
So now, as close as we are to having something like this, we still have a surprising amount of work to go because you'll see the product that comes out of that mold is covered in flash all the way around it. The eyes have holes in and there might be some artifacting on the inside where the rotocast resin has built up or dripped. Thankfully, because I have a lot of experience with this, you can see there's no lumps or bumps on the inside or things that will poke out and take your eyes out, which I had a lot of in my early molds, but we just attack that with a Dremel, a bit like this. And this is a Dremel. We use this to remove all of the stuff we don't want on the mask. It's pretty self-explanatory. We go around the edge to take the flash off with the cutting disc, open the eyes with the same cutting disc, and then smooth out all the surfaces that have left little ragged edges with a little sanding tool, which in this case is a little, is a little diamond encrusted dome piece. Then it's a quick wash, and then we prime it with our plastic primer, which depending on the resin you use, you either need to use plastic primer or with the resin I use, you can just use a normal primer, which allows you to then paint it smoothly. How do we get what I believe is a nice natural paint job like that? We do that by going in slow stages like this. Our first slow stage is we put a base coat down for our wood color. Now, you might see this and think, oh, wood isn't that color. In fact, you've just mixed brown with gray. And yeah, most wood is more gray than it is brown. So putting that down as a base coat and then working your way up to the color of the wood you want, which in this case is kind of a light birch, is how you get that depth of color. Base coat it in a nice earthy grayish color. And then here we are going over it in a lighter brown with dry brushing. So we are avoiding putting the lighter color in any of the recesses. And then we actually do that twice because we want a slightly lighter and then a much lighter color and we go over with a much lighter color, even lighter. I keep saying lighter, that's because we're slowly working the color up and we don't even think about the colors that we're going to be painting on it in a moment, which are the red, the white, and the greens, and the bit of blue and the black, because we want the base color of the actual materials of this mask to look nice. Because this is a traditionally made mask rather than something mass manufactured, its colours will be stained wood in a handcrafted manner. Once we have all the wood texture down, we can then start painting it in our colours. For all of this, we're using System 3 Artist Acrylic. So this is really high quality paint, so it goes on really smoothly. But we really have to think about our ordering for how this goes on. So here we actually start with the white because the white is weaker than most colors, so we can hem it in with our other colors that go over it. Like the red will give us nice borders on the white where they meet. And one thing we want to be very careful of is to actually not paint these bold colors into the recesses of the wood that we've just dry brushed, because it makes it look a lot more natural if you can see some of the wood grain go through the primary colors that we're putting on now. So once we have our red and our white down, we, can, we actually start putting in some nice additional details. In fact, we go back over a couple of bits of the edges of the white and the red to touch it up whilst they dry. And then we can start putting in our other colors like the greens and the blues, which are all extra little details that go over the white. But of course, we've waited for that to dry so they don't mix and smudge each other. We paint the red tongue first and then we paint the black which hems the edges of the red tongue in because the black goes over really nicely and also the edge of the white which gives us much nicer colored areas and of course painting the black on the inside of the mouth allows time for the red of the tongue to dry because we're going to be painting white over that red and we need to wait for that red to dry before we put white on it otherwise we're going to be painting pink on it by accident I hope that gives you a good primer into thinking about the ordering of which you use your paints, because that's genuinely important. And also how magical dry brushing can be and how it really rewards you for putting that, that little extra time into sculpting. And then after all that work, you finally have something you can be happy with. 
It's not fantastically comfortable to wear, so I will be uh, putting some foam around the inside. I have some self adhesive foam that I like to use, but you can use any sort of Eva foam. If you're a cosplayer, you've got foam around. I hope you are all a little bit more knowledgeable about how these are made and perhaps can give something a go yourself in the future. If you do, please, please be sure to keep me updated with what you make. If you have any questions, drop me a message either through YouTube or through my Facebook page. And I wish you the best of luck. Hopefully this has primed you and made you excited about trying, about trying something new or improving the skills that you're trying to get. Anyway, I hope you stay around to the channel to see more work like these. Thank you for watching and goodbye.